Alright, so in chapter 8, chapter 8 is liquids and solids. So, I'm going to talk about a lot of liquids and solids. Alright, the first section that the textbook covers is a comparison of liquids and solids to gases. So, um, well, most uh, organic liquids and solids have densities from about 0.7 to 2 grams per centimeter cubed, whereas um, most gases at STP are generally between uh, 10 to the negative uh, 2 or 10 to the negative 4 grams per uh, centimeters cubed. So, also, gases expand to fill all available space, must be kept in an enclosed container, while liquids fill any container from the bottom up to a level dictated only by the mass of liquid present. Uh, liquid also conforms to the shape of the container, and solids uh, maintain their shape without any container. Third and finally, the um, there's not much um, significant uh, attractive forces in gases like intermolecular between the molecules, but and um, there's a, a much larger presence of this in liquids and solids, and it is not negligible. So you're going to learn about it in the video. Um, also, there are some obvious uh, physical differences. Gases flowing around the air, liquids and solids are not. And they're more cohesive. So, there you go. That's just a couple few things. Really, it's just this first block paragraph in the book. I'm sure you can read it on your own if you want to go over it more. But, intermolecular forces. Alright, the first... Um first force, intermolecular force, that the book talks about is dipole to dipole. Now, um, as you may or may not remember, when you do the electronegativity of, an, uh, of a molecule, let's say HCl, for example, we know that the um, electronegativity of water is 2.2 and the electronegativity of chlorine is 3.2, giving a charge of 1 in that direction. That's a enough to make it a uh, a polar molecule and so what happens is when you draw HCl if you just imagine this being an H or <laughs> obviously that's an H I'm gonna say I'm gonna draw just like a ball let's imagine the red one is uh, the hydrogen make this white one bigger and that will be chlorine well because chlorine is electroneg more electronegative, this end gets the uh, negative charge, so you get that little symbol, and negative, and this end is positive. Um, so, what happens here is that these charges, well, if this is an aqueous solution of like hydrochloric acid, for example, this um, there might be another molecule just flown around here, and we'll give him a chlorine too. Another HCl. Well, just like before, this is the uh, positive end. This is the negative end. And if you know the simple rule of physics, opposites attract. This negative and this positive here, they're going to want to join up. So they attract. And so in this way, a bunch of molecules that are the same really can... Uh, they stick together because of polarity. So you just get this. This is happening where the electronegativity um, caused by dipole moments um, creates opposite charges that attract uh, molecules together. So this is called dipole to dipole because there's two dipole moments and they're being attracted to each other because of their opposite charges. Because it's going that way, that way, that way. So, as you can see, they are attracted to each other because of their dipoles, which I said already, whereas gaseous molecules are just, they don't, th this never happens. It's They're never close enough together, and it's just high energy, but point is, dipole to dipole is one of the forces, and that's why, and that's what it does. Alright, well, the next thing the book talks about, it calls it London Forces of Attraction. When I learned it as, as London Aspersion Forces, or just Aspersion Forces, either way works. And what happens here is you get a nice molecule. Well, you just use argon, because they have argon. So if you imagine argon, and it has 
bunch of electrons around it in, a, in its cloud. So this is going to be pretty inaccurate. But imagine its electrons are in a cloud. Well, because the electrons are like randomly configured, um, some of the time there might be more on one side than the other. So you might get a bunch over here, or maybe only a few over here. Well, all the electrons on this side make this side more negative, and because this side is more negative, you get a bit of a um, of a charge. So this side's then the positive side. This is this is much weaker than the dipole to dipole forces, but um, say we have another. Ar oh, I don't want to pink for the argon. So say we have like another argon up here with its electrons only a few over there and a ton on the other side which makes it have a uh, positive charge there negative charge or I'm sorry switched a uh, negative charge there positive charge there well like before positive and negative attract right so that side is going to be attracted to that side so if I had more room you would see uh, this argon like flip down here a little bit and this positive side would be a little bit attracted to that negative side or you'd see the negative side flip down next to the positive side anyways the random uh, random electron movements in the uh, in the atom or molecule um, also called electron sloshing causes the uh, temporary charges temporary weak charges and um, it's also called induced dipole forces as a side note but um and then these these forces cause attraction between atoms, which gives you the London force of attraction, which is one of the intermolecular forces that liquids and solids have that gases don't really have. Uh, just to clarify a uh, fine point that these charges are only temporary because the electrons will move to new positions, so each side could get a new charge like every instant, so really. Um, yeah, but there always there tends to be a charge on one side or the other just because they don't usually split evenly down the middle. So that's again electron sloshing, London dispersion forces, or induced dipole. Couple names, also a uh, van der Waals forces, and instantaneous dipole forces. Just a bunch of names for this little thing. All right. Well, if you remember from before, talked about um, the. Uh, electronegativity of hydrogen. Well, hydrogen, because it has a fairly low electronegativity of 2.2, .2, I mean, not the lowest on the table, but reasonably low, it gets a, um, it forms what they call hydrogen bonds with certain high electronegative um, atoms. So these are pretty much the um, atoms with electronegativities over uh, like 2.5 that aren't fluorine. I'll talk about that in a minute, maybe. Probably I will talk about that. So, oxygen, uh, chlorine, bromine, iodine even, I think still counts. Nitrogen for sure. Um, yeah, I, I'd say um, those are the those are the main ones, and iodine's even on the edge. I would say closer to three, like a three or above, makes a good hydrogen bond. So we're just gonna leave iodine out. It's kind of subjective, anyways. Hydrogen bonding. So like oxygen, for example, has a three point four. So when water bonds, when water bonds there, we get the uh, two dipole moments going up right each one has a uh, 1.2 charge negative 1.2 and so because it's negative on the oxygen side and uh, so this this creates a really polar molecule so when this happens it's um so if there's another water molecule both these molecules are really polar now because of these high um, differences in electronegativity and bonds. So this side is very negative and these hydrogens therefore are pretty positive. So if I get a new color here, these 
will bond. So, and then this strong attraction between the um, the highly polar molecules when um, it's hydrogen bonded with a high electronegativity um, element like oxygen, chlorine, nitrogen, bromine, it's called a hydrogen bond. And it tends to have, it tends to be, um, it's, it's stronger than dipole, dipole forces and it gives um, the molecules high boiling points. So a uh, note on fluorine, the reason some people don't consider it a hydrogen bond is because there's uh, even more electronegativity than like oxygen and hydrogen for example, but uh, molecules like uh, hydrogen fluoride will have a lower boiling point than uh, like H2O water because the hydrogen fluoride just, it's, it's such a strong uh, dipole-dipole force that they tend to just make a nice row which uh, splits a little easier, um, which vaporizes a little easier, boils a little easier. So that's why some people don't consider it a true hydrogen bond because it's not as strong as the bond between hydrogen and oxygen, for example. So there you go, hydrogen bonding. Remember, it's not between the hydrogen and the oxygen that's the hydrogen bond. It's between the hydrogen and the oxygen of two different elements. It's the strong dipole to dipole force is what the hydrogen bond is but it's caused by hydrogen bonding with one of these four elements. Alright, so now we're moving on to properties of liquids, physical properties of liquids. So one of the easiest ones is, uh, or one of the most common ones you'll hear about is surface tension. So if we take water as an example, I'm sure you've all seen this trick like a billion times. If this is a, a penny sideways, and you add drops onto it until the water stays on top of the penny even though it's much larger than the penny. Well, what's happening here is the strong hydrogen bonds um, they're, they're pulling, it's a strong force between other molecules in here. Right, so all these H2O's are they're all trying to pull into other H2O's and so this strong pull is enough to overcome the the uh, the force down on the um, on the water from gravity to make it just split. So that's what you're seeing there. That's the example of surface tension. But if I kill all this stuff, if I can figure this out. Boom, boom. That dead. All right. So surface tension is just um, it's intermolecular forces like Alright, I'm going to write this down. Intermolecular forces um, like uh, hydrogen bonds and uh, dipole-dipole and dipole ion, which they don't cover in this book, but it's the attraction between a charged dipole and a uh, charged ion. Anyways, the, the uh, these intermolecular forces not um not going to be a uh, London aspersion because it's just not strong enough but it's a uh, it's inward forces between the molecules that cause the surface of the um of the liquid to have its own um I don't know stability almost like you can float like a paper clip this is a bunch of water because the surface tension is strong enough to hold it's, it's strong enough to counteract the weight of the paper clip because of all the intermolecular forces pulling the water into itself if that makes sense also some vocab you should know for surface tension I don't it never came up with me on the uh, on the um, exam but there's something called uh, surfactants, certain, uh, certain chemicals called surfactants, and they're, they're special chemicals that um, disrupt surface tension because they disrupt the cohesive forces. So a lot of uh, soaps are surfactants because they just they get in and they, they disrupt the, the strong bonds and the intermolecular forces and the surface tension goes away. So that's some vocab you should know.
All right, for those of you who don't know, um, viscosity is the uh, liquid's resistance to flow. So I'm going to do a couple liquids and I'm talk about how much they flow. So first going to talk about alkanes. Now you have not had your, um, I'm going to make them yellow, you have not had your organic chemistry unit yet. So alkanes are hydrocarbons made up of just hydrogens and carbons. Uh, pretty much. That's all I'm going to get into for now. They have a couple of special rules, but um, for now all you know is that they're hydrocarbons. And because hydrogen, or hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.2, carbon has an electronegative two, of 2.4, they're not very polar, they don't have strong dipoles, and so they don't have a lot of uh, uh, cohesion and attractive forces between the and um, between molecules in the liquid. So this will pour out very easily because there's not much forces trying to keep it together so it just flies out well next we might have water well water has a good amount of forces so it's not gonna fly out so much but it'll still pour out right water is pretty good at pouring but it has the hydrogen bonding strong dipole dipole so that makes it much more viscous than the uh, alkanes over here. I'll just put hydrocarbon H2O. So that's that's um, it's gonna have a more viscous, a more viscosity. It's gonna be more viscous because of the strong intermolecular forces. Well, if we take a final cup, maybe this one's full of syrup. So I'll try and make this kind of like brown color if I can get away with that that's kinda red anyways it's hardly gonna come out at all right well syrup is um it's it's very viscous because it has um, a lot of sugar in it and sugar has a ton of OH groups which hydrogen bond to the water in the syrup mix right so now we have a ton of hydrogen bonding happening between the sugar and the water, and the sugar is, itself is large, which makes it harder to pour, just on and on. So um, there's a lot of intermolecular forces and resistance to flow in syrups. So that's why syrup is super viscous. I'm gonna put two uh, greater than signs because it's really just viscous. So there you have it, viscosity. It's caused by strong intermolecular forces. Alright, at this point in your life, I would hope you have a pretty good definition of evaporation. But you, if you don't, it's just um, pretty much the process when a, a liquid in an open container is slowly converted to a gas. Well, some, some liquids evaporate faster than other liquids. So, if um, I'm going to pretend this uh, yellow, yellow puddle over here, oh, that's white color now. This yellow puddle is, uh, is another alkane or a hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbons tend to have um, very low boiling points and evaporate quickly because they don't have very many intermolecular forces, right? So a, um, a, a molecule or chemical that evaporates quickly and has a low boiling point um, is called volatile. Don't think it means explosive. That's a mistake. It just means it has a low boiling point and tends to evaporate quickly. This is again because of um, weak and absent um, intermolecular forces between hydrocarbons. Water, on the other hand, if we go over here. Water has its uh, hydrogen bonds, pretty pretty strong bonding. So it is not volatile. It has a much higher boiling point than most hydrocarbons, especially alkanes, but we'll get into that later during the organic chemistry unit, I imagine. But there you go. Water, not volatile because it has hydrogen bonds. Makes it stronger. Strong intermolecular forces tend to hold the molecule together or the the substance together better, so it doesn't 
split and the individual molecules and turn into a gas. So there you go. Alright, so here's going to get you um, an example to get you used to the idea of surface area. So if I asked you to tell me which of these uh, three beakers would, um, or which of the liquids in these three beakers would evaporate the fastest, if I told you they were all 10 mil of H2O, what would you think? Well, there's the same amount in each, each uh, container, so they should evaporate the same? Well, that's not right. I mean, even common sense would tell you probably this guy is going to evaporate the fastest. Well, let's look at why. There's more, um, well, most of the heat's probably going to come from the sun, but if also if you're, if you're boiling, just anywhere a heat source is applied, the water is more stretched out here, right? So there's more of it that's going to be hitting the heat source, whether it be the sun up there shooting heat down or a burner here shooting heat up. And so, because there's more water hitting the heat source at any given time, it's going to evaporate fastest. So I'm going to put that there. Well, what about between the beaker and the test tube? Again, surface area, right? The beaker clearly has more surface area and can also take, um, therefore more of the water is hit by uh, sources of heat. So, again, I'm going to get another gradient sign. So, this is going to be longest to evaporate. There you have it. Surface area. That's something you're going to have to consider a lot later, especially in um, kinetics. They might, they might ask you a question on the AP test, like, how can I speed up this chemical reaction? One of the answers might be like, oh, add a catalyst, which will lower activation energy. But another answer could be, um, if it's a solid, like mash up the solid, it's split into particles so that the particles have more surface area than just a block of solid. Or if it's a liquid, spread out in a thin container so there's more surface area of liquid in contact with the heat source or whatever you're doing. Surface area. More surface area, faster reaction. So if you think of evaporation as a reaction, which many people often do, also, by the way, you'll probably use this later, like in thermodynamics, you might have the reaction of liquid turns to gas, but more than likely you'll have a double arrow here instead of just a single. And this double arrow, if I fix it, means that the reaction is going both ways at once. So you might get just this reaction of, I don't know, maybe H2O liquid turns to H2O gas, and it will be a, it's, it is a chemical reaction, really. I mean, if you think about it like this, and so it can be sped up by having more surface area. So, surface area. Now I'm done. Uh, the next thing the uh, book talks about is vapor pressure. I'm not going to talk too much about that because I discussed it somewhat in the last video when talking about the uh, gas experiment so say we have a bunch of water in this little container well at a certain temperature well this water is constantly evaporating and the rate is determined by the temperature right there's always just a little bit evaporating and you can't even tell well uh, well I should say you can't tell because it's not at its boiling point, which means that as it's evaporating up into this into particles, particles in the air are condensating or condensing. I'm sorry, condensing back into water. So, and that's because we're not at the right temperature. We're not at the boiling point. At which point, the gas leaving will be uh, much higher than the uh, um, condensation re-entering. So gonna kill these lines so vapor pressure is as the name hints it is pressure from the vapor so at any given temperature water has a vapor pressure determined by the amount of gas being turned or the amount of liquid being turned into gas and pushing up into the air 
So if I had this in a closed container around all of this, and there was, let's say, oh, well, that was awful. Let's say there's O2 in here. Well, now the pressure's going up because the water, well, not going up, but the pressure is higher than just the pressure of the oxygen because the water is giving off uh, vapor, which um, adds more gas, which increases the pressure because the volume isn't changing. So, there you go. That's uh, vapor pressure. And if you remember your partial pressure, just a quick recap, the pressure of the oxygen plus the vapor pressure will equal the total pressure. Also, um, it's important to remember that the vapor pressure is not a constant number. It will be different at every temperature because the temperature will change the uh, reaction rate between liquid and gas of water and yeah so there you go don't get confused so boiling point a boiling point is when the um, liquid boils and or the temperature at which the liquid boils which is um, technically when the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure around the liquid or the prevailing atmospheric pressure around that liquid. So, um, yeah, boiling point will determine or will change at certain um, like altitudes. But uh, if I just worry about this, uh, normal boiling point is the I'll just put BP is the uh, uh, boiling point at one atm. This is important because at different altitudes it'll have a different boiling point so let's say you're boiling tea or you're boiling water to make tea on the Himalayas your water might boil at I don't know let's say 80 degrees Celsius instead because the Himalayas are much higher in the air than uh, um, than a normal level like sea level and so because they're much higher in the air there's less air pushing down they're, they're much higher, so there's less um, room between, yeah, there's less air pushing down the mountain, which means less versus that down, that down. There's less ATM on top of the mountain. Less pressure means that the, uh, the liquid needs le a um, smaller vapor pressure, right? Because there's less uh, prevailing atmospheric pressure around the liquid, so... Perhaps the uh, vapor pressure at 80 degrees Celsius will now be enough to boil your water, or your, yeah, your water. So you might even get a like, cold boiling water, or just warm. So boiling point. It's a little bit on that. There's also something where you can. Um, well, you're probably not going to learn about this right now. I, I haven't read the whole chapter before I start this video, but when you when you add things to a um, to a solution, or well, when you make a solution, like if I added sugar to my water, the sugar water would have a higher boiling point than just regular water because, like for example, sugar will make more hydrogen bonds, it'll be pretty, pretty strongly bonded to the water, which will make more intermolecular forces, which will require more energy to break the bonds and make a gas, which will raise the boiling point, which is called boiling point elevation. So doesn't look like the book is going to cover that right now, but just something to keep in your mind for later. You know, wow your teacher with your knowledge. Boiling point elevation. Alright, here we are talking about heat of vaporization. This is a, looks like a pretty small blurb in the book. Yeah, it's a pretty small blurb in the book, but it's pretty much, um, it's just the heat or the, uh, the energy. I should say energy. Delta H is usually energy. Sometimes it's heat, but... It's the energy needed to convert one gram of liquid into a gram of gas. So in this case, the energy is going to be heat, probably. So, our, um, this is the energy needed to convert one gram of liquid into one gram of gas at a temperature equal to the normal boiling point of the liquid. So, yeah, I mean, it's not a super difficult concept. It's also, as you can see from this equation here, it's uh, the heat of vaporization is going to be the the negative 
um, or the opposite of the heat of condensation, which would be the energy needed to convert one gram of gas into one gram of liquid at a temperature equal to the normal boiling point. Or, I'm sorry, not the normal boiling point. But you know what I mean. Anyways, um, there you go. So that's heat of vaporization. Uh, later, you will use this, um, and I believe it's in thermodynamics, you'll have a unit on calorimetry or calorimetry, which is when you measure, um, you can measure how much energy you put into something and then like, or you can measure, well there's a lot of ways you can measure, but we did a lab where we burned a candle and we, um, we used the amount of candle burnt like the mass of candle burnt and the mo molecules in the candle to determine how much heat was applied through the flame. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with this, but most of it will come up later. Also related to boiling points, as you might, as you probably can just figure out by yourself, higher intermolecular force, oh, if I can draw here that'd be great, intermolecular forces means uh, molecular means higher boiling point means higher delta H vape or heat of vaporization and there you go heat of vaporization that's all and probably more than you need to know at this point if your teacher is following the Barron's book if not you might need a uh, more in-depth were our version of heat of vaporization, in which case, if I had to guess at this point in time, it will probably be in the video on thermodynamics. So, you can look for that video too.